Well, hello there, and you join us here today to ask the question, is Tudor a one-trick pony? <laughs> Tom, you aren't a massive fan of the Black Bay, are you? No, I'm not particularly. I find Tudor's offerings a little bit kind of cumbersome. I think their their case design sort of feels a bit like factory settings. You know, they, they just <laughs> come out and they're, Tudor are like, oh yeah, keep it like that. It's like the Blender Cube. You know, the default cube. It's just like you're supposed to sort of elaborate on it and sculpt it, but they're like, nah, keep it like that. That's a very niche reference. If you understood it, <laughs> let us know in the comments below. You're absolutely right. I refer to the Tudor Black Bay 58, Tom, as the perfect watch. I own one, but it took me about five years to purchase it because although it's perfect, it's not particularly exciting. It is yeah. very, very, very vanilla. It's, mm. it's my favourite flavour of ice cream. Plain. <laughs> I mean, speaking of ice cream, like you've got the snowflake hand. That's Tudor, isn't it? But I think snowflake is generous. Yeah. That's a generous title. That is a block. Yeah. Maybe that that is default cube. Default cube hands, not snowflakes. <laughs> they didn't apply subdivision surface to the Tudor to get to the Rolex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Tom, I thought what we'd do is try and understand why this situation exists, dig back in time a little bit, and see if we can work our way to, is Tudor a one-trick pony? And if so, why? Okay. Let's go all the way back to 1905, which is when one Hans Wilsdorf founded a little watch company you might have heard of called Rolex. I have heard of that. Yeah, familiar with them. He wasn't a watchmaker. He didn't get his hands dirty, file out little cogs and put them together and go, aha, a watch. He was a marketeer. And one thing he understood that was really ahead of his time, that brand names were very, very important. Most other watchmakers just used their name, if anything at all, or even just put the jeweler's name on the dial. That whole bunch of unpronounceable people that we have to wrestle with every day on our podcast. <laughs> exactly. And that is exactly one of the reasons why he chose Rolex. It could be pronounced by anyone anywhere in the world. It sounded luxurious. But Rolex wasn't the only thing he tried. It wasn't just a, aha, I will do Rolex and that is all I will do. He, in the founding of Tudor, spread his brain across the world to try and think of a bunch of other different names that might work. Do you want to hear some of the, the names that he tried? Yeah, go on. Roll Watt Co. What? Roll Watt Co. It's like Rolex Watch Co, but all smushed together ah. in a really horrible sounding word. Yeah, dreadful. Falcon. Ooh. Gen X, which as we now know is between Gen Z and... Wow, yeah. I mean, again, that's his forward thinking. He th Maybe he thought in the future people will be obsessed with the age generations. <laughs> But considering boomers are the only people who can actually afford Rolexes now, I think that's kind of appropriate. Yeah. You had Lonex. Lonex, that's what you need to get in order to buy one, yeah. Rolexis, Lexis, Hofex, and Wintex. Wintex is coming. <laughs> and Hofex, that's what you do when you're fed up with your Rolex and you drop kick it into the lake. Hofex. He was obsessed with the letter X, I think because of the word luxury. Uh, lux in French. Yeah. He even, and this goes to show how much he was thinking from a marketing perspective, he even considered Omegra. Uh, that's flying quite close to a rival brand. Was that the intention? I, I imagine it was his intention, and I imagine his lawyers asked him kindly not to. Um, but eventually, he settled on Tudor, because he was a big fan of the English, and in particular the Tudor era. And he used Tudor to create a whole bunch of watches using Rolex cases, hands, crowns, etc., but packaged with a cheaper movement to offer the Rolex brand at a cheaper price point, diversifying his portfolio, so to speak. Cool. Yeah, sounds good. In fact, I remember from my early Watchfinder days, you know, having some Tudors um, with the Rolex crown logo on the bracelets and on the crowns still. Yeah, exactly the same parts. Yeah. It's a bit like um, when someone looks in there... Bugatti and finds a part with a Volkswagen label on it. So that happens all the time, Tom. You wouldn't understand. Does it? Yeah. I'll take your word for that. <laughs> <laughs> Different circles. 
But that was all fine up until the point when quartz watches became a thing and mechanical watches were no longer really necessary. So selling a cheaper version of your mechanical watch to militaries and stuff, well, they were just buying quartz watches now. They didn't care. So Tudor had to try and re-pitch its brand. Rolex went, hey, we're luxury. Look, buy us in gold and all of this stuff. And, and people, people bought them in gold through the 80s and 90s and, and started to get into collecting vintage Rolex in the 90s. But Tudor was just left adrift. And they came up with interesting watches like the Iconaut, which just looks to me like a room full of people going, what do we do? Oh God, what do we do? Yeah, <laughs> throw everything at it. That's, I mean, this is the first time I'm seeing it and um, I'm can't quite focus on it because there's so much stuff going on. Yeah. They were like, how should we design it? And it was like, well, the, the bezel's at Jimmy's house and the, the dial's at Frank's house. Yeah, it looks like designed by panic. <laughs> So, I mean, they, they actually shrank as a brand. They were closing down shops all around the world. It looked like it was all over. Up until 2010, when we saw the release, or rather a reissue of a 1970s Tudor chronograph, here called the Heritage Chrono. And you can see it's got that. It looks a little bit Paul Newman-y in the sense that it's got an, quite an exotic looking dial, big chunky markers, lots of 70s colors. It's quite a bold thing. Yeah. But what they hit on there was this idea of buying something that looks very similar to a Rolex, but for less money. I mean, we could both get on board with that idea. That is a pitch that's gonna run and run. Oh, and run and run it did. Because two years later, after the success of the Heritage Chrono, they thought, well, people seem to like this idea of owning something that looks a bit like a Rolex. They could see from the feedback that people were saying, oh, it's kind of Daytona-ish. Yeah, I'd, I'd rock that. So they went full bore and copied the Rolex Submariner. Now, the thing is that Tudor also made a Submariner, so it works for the heritage, but it just meant that they could go, hey, look at this watch that looks almost identical to a Submariner from more than a foot away. Here it is for just a few thousand pounds. Would you like one? And everyone said, yes, please. I mean, what did you think of the Black Bay, the original Black Bay when it came out? I don't know if you remember that that far. I don't remember. And actually, this is probably my main problem with Tudor and it's it's the catalog and the coherency of the catalog. I mean if you want to talk about Tudor being a one trick pony, let me just read from their website. New watches from Tudor, new Black Bay, new Black Bay 54, new Black Bay 31 36 39 41, new Black Bay GMT, Black Bay with Cherry, Black Bay 0, Black Bay Championship Edition DX. That's a lot of Black Bays, isn't it? That sounds a bit one trick pony to me. It certainly does. Even things like the Black Bay Chrono. That's a Black Bay with pushes and some subdials on it. Yeah. I mean, what makes it Black Bay? <laughs> You're asking the big questions, Tom. I don't think we have time <laughs> in this show for such existential <laughs> thoughts. How did they get Black Bay? <laughs> Who is Black Bay and what does he want? But here's the thing. Black Bay isn't the only thing they make. They have made a bunch of different stuff. You've got the Pelagos. Yeah, that is a, a more modern interpretation of the diver. Comes in titanium, has that step bezel that you covet so much. Yes. Looks a bit different, feels a bit more modern. But even in the FXD variant that people seem to really latch onto in the 39mm variant, it's still not as popular as a Black Bay. People aren't buying it. Case in point, do you remember the Tudor North flag? I do remember that. That's quite exciting, isn't it? That's got like a flash of neon on it or something, isn't it, if I remember correctly? Yeah, it's got a, a yellow seconds hand, it's got a yellow power reserve marker, has That's like it. ceramic elements in the bezel, has an integrated bracelet. This came out before people were going gaga for integrated again, and it flopped. It flopped really hard. People wanted the heritage stuff, they didn't want you to making something new. Yeah, I mean, that's weird because looking at that, that's what I'm talking about. It's not the default cube. They've sliced a bit off the, the top and bottom and given it a really cool integrated <laughs> case there. And it's exciting. That's the most exciting thing Tudor have ever done. I know. I look at it right now and I think I'd like to go to this one, please. It's a really, really cool looking watch. It's got so much character. But apparently that's not what people want. And that's why we found ourselves moving down this process of iteration and optimization of the Black Bay form, the Black Bay into 58, into 54, to diversify that product 
into very small SKUs that give the masses what they want. And that's why I think that Tudor is perceived as a one-trick pony because it's been forced to be. It's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, Rolex very carefully curate their catalogue, don't they? Their, their output is just one of refinement or noodling, if you will. <laughs> and uh, it feels like Tudor should be trying stuff out all the time. And But they, they seem to be very, very sort of staunchly refining their catalogue instead of giving us anything new. You're right. They're not trying to make anything to blow people's minds. As exciting as you're going to get is seeing the Tudor Black Bay with a silver case. Yeah. That's that's really all you're going to get. That's why the, the, yeah. the 54 was so appealing to people, because it was everything they wanted but a little tweak. It's the ultimate in new hattery, and it's, de it's determined by what we, the buyers, do with our wallets. And it's, it's a funny thing, really, because you see this not just in watches, but all over the place. People say they want two-seater convertible sports cars. They say they want a Tudor with an integrated bracelet. But when those things happen, they don't actually buy them. Most of the time, like me included, we go to the vanilla, we stick with a safe, we don't wander off and go and have pistachio and hazelnut ice cream or anything crazy like that. We stick to our vanilla because it's safe, it's familiar, and it's going to stay the duration. I kind of see Tudor as like, if Rolex is the Domino's pizza and people are queuing out the door for it, it's the super pizza next door that doesn't have a queue and you go in there. It's not as good, but it's the same thing pretty much. Yeah, it's the, we've got Rolex at home. <laughs> yeah, uh, so in answer to your question, is Tudor a one trick pony? Uh, yes, but that's okay. Yeah, because we only taught it one trick. To be fair, watches are in this tricky situation where they've all come out, they've all had their hits, haven't they? They just seem to be in this perpetually tri tricky second album situation where they're just like, oh, I'll just remix the first one again. <laughs> Everyone like that. <laughs> Limited edition with a bonus extra track. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go, dear viewer and listener. That's our conclusion. What do you think of Tudor? One trick pony or is it a little bit more smart than that? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and listening and we will see you next time. Please like and subscribe as well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.